Bring Back Rock. Everybody, it's Dean. Welcome to Bring Back Rock. You'll have to excuse me. I've got a little bit of a cold. My throat's a little sore. So uh, sorry if my voice is a little raspy or cracks a little bit. But anyway, today we're talking about the underrated albums of 1985. Now there was a couple that I missed in 1984. I'm going to get to when appropriate and one from the 1982-83 video. But there is a time when I'm going to talk about those. Um, but first, let's just say 1985 was a great year. It was the year that rock and roll, the, that 80s style metal, really solidified itself as they were here and they weren't going to go away. Bands were releasing their second and third album and were just as popular or even more popular than they were early on. So um, let's see. I had Motley Crue. Uh, they did Theater of Pain, which they did that whole switch from kind of leather studs post-apocalyptic look to completely glam, which kind of set the stage for those L.A. glam bands that came in over the next few years. Um, they also had Home Sweet Home, which reestablished the fact that you need a power ballad, at least one power ballad on your album for that crossover. Rat released their second album, uh, Invasion of Your Privacy, which most Rat fans agree was just as good, if not better, than Out of the Cellar. Um, bon Jovi released their second album, 7800 Degrees Fahrenheit, which had some really good songs on it, and um, eventually went platinum once uh, Slipper and White came out. Um, let's see what else. There was Megadeth. Megadeth released their first album, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good. Combat Records gave them $8,000 to make that album. Um, and then there was also Dawkins' uh, third album, uh, Under Lock and Key, which ended up going platinum and had In My Dreams and um, It's Not Love off of it. And then this band, which I want to talk about their 1984 album a little bit here, but the band is Wasp. Um, they were the first band I ever saw live opening up for Quiet Riot. I immediately became a fan. Um, I kind of glossed over them a little bit in the last last episode. If I mentioned them at all, I had them in my notes. I think I just forgot. So I wanted to mention, because that's a crime, that first album in 1984 was huge and hugely underrated, just like uh, the album that came out this year, The Last Command, which did go, or 1985, which did go gold, but um, probably deserved a lot more recognition. Another band that I left off the 1984 list, which I'm surprised I didn't get called out on, was Y&T in Rock We Trust, which might be my favorite Y&T record. Had album had songs like um, Rock and Roll is Going to Save the World, Lipstick and Leather, Liar on there. Some really good songs. Uh, the video for, I believe, Lipstick and Leather had the band partying with the Twisted Sister guys and the robot um, mascot off the album cover closing in on the party, and then when it got to the door, D. Snyder was underneath there. Um, I have a uh, Y&T Twisted Sister story, but don't really have time to tell it right now. Um, so that was the second one I missed was in Rock We Trust, and they released the album Down for the Count in 1985, which had their biggest album, uh, excuse me, their biggest single, um, Summertime Girls, which some Y&T fans are upset that that's their biggest single since it's probably their most commercial song. But I don't care. I love the song. Love the video. Um, Down for the Count was underrated in 1985. Um, all right. Who else have I got to talk about in 1985? Actually, before I continue with the underrated records, I should mention that there was a couple classic bands that also released albums. Um, Kiss released Asylum, which was kind of continuing their success that was built on um, Lick It Up, Animalize, and then Asylum came out. And also Aerosmith reunited with all the original members. So Joe Perry and Brad Whitford were back. Um, and they released Done With Mirrors. I don't think they were 100% ready to really come back and gel together because the first single was actually a cover of the Joe Perry song with the music to the talking. Um, the album didn't do quite as well as they had hoped, which set up their next record um, really as a make or break record, but Aerosmith was back with Done With Mirrors this year in 1985. And also, uh, in case you didn't know, the Rick Dufay, uh, one of the guitar players that had replaced Brad Whitford, is actually a big part of the reason that Aerosmith got back together. He said, you got to get back with Joe Perry. Aerosmith is Tyler and Perry. So he was kind of the catalyst there, which is kind of cool. All right. Another one that I forgot to mention, the 82-83 video is a band called The Bees, B apostrophe Z Z. It had a singer called Tom Holland in it. 
and a drummer named Stephen Riley, who you know probably from Wasp and L.A. Guns. Now, Tom Holland went on and formed the band Holland. In 1985, they released an album called Little Monsters. I didn't discover it till later, but really good record, underrated. You should check it out if you don't know about it. Also, Michael Angelo Badio was the um, guitar player here. You probably know him from Nitro. Really good shredder, great guitarist, but in, in Nitro, everything was over the top. Here, he's much more mellow. He does shred here and there where the song allows it, but he doesn't overpower the song at all. So Holland Little Monsters is definitely an album worth checking out. All right, so the next band that released an underrated album in 1985, you've probably heard me talk about them before. One of my favorite albums, really not that hard, more of a pop, power pop um, album with really dark lyrics. Um, I was introduced to them by my friend Debbie and I, probably the album I played as much as any other album. Candy, Whatever Happened to Fun, came out in 1985. Gilby Clark, of course, is the guitar player. He ended up going on to Guns N' Roses for a while and releasing solo records. Uh, Kyle Vincent is still having a solo um, career going on. Um, a lot of the band morphed into the Electric Angels, which we're going to end up talking about at some point, too. But Candy, Whatever Happened to Fun, um, catchy as hell. Dark lyrics. If you didn't discover them when you were a teenager and could relate to the lyrics, it might not be as impressed, but an album that I just absolutely adore. Um, the next one I want to talk about is underrated. Is actually Twisted Sisters Come Out and Play. Um... Stay Hungry was a huge hit, and Come Out and Play had some misfires. First, their single that they released was Leader of the Pack, which maybe went great over went over great live, but probably wasn't the greatest single for their first single on the second record. And so for the second single, they did um, Be Cruel to Your School, which had Alice Cooper in the video and in the, uh, in the song. But they hired Tom Savini to do, which kind of takes place in a high school if you haven't seen it, kids walking around like zombies, actual zombies. They use uh, Tom Savini, a famous makeup artist, did all the um, zombie makeup effects. MTV saw it and said, yeah, we're not playing that. That's that was <laughs> uh, The zombies were pretty realistic. Not realistic per se, but there was some gore and things like that going on. So uh, their first two singles were Misfires, and that was the end of their, end of their uh, second record. It came out in November of 85. I got it for Christmas of that year. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but my sister there came a little in so you could order Twisted Sister gear. And uh, right there, Dee Snyder, half of his face is lighter than the other half. My sister drew on it, pissed me off. I tried to erase it, started to erase the, you know, all the ink off of it. And it's much, much lighter. I do forgive my sister now, officially, in case there was any question. But... Um, it also has my favorite Twisted Sister song, which is Come Out and Play. I absolutely love this song, Come Out and Play. Um, it does maybe have some filler, but uh, still an underrated album. It deserved more, deserved better than it got, I think. Next, an album um, and a band that I've been singing their praises forever, Black and Blue, uh, Without Love, came out in 1985. Um, Miss Mystery, Nature of the Beach, Swing Time, Stop the Lightning. Uh, so many great songs on that album. A lot of people think the first album was much better. I think the first two albums are absolutely amazing, both of them. You should check out Black and Blue Without Love. All right, next we have another band that I talked about in the last, uh, in the last uh, 1984 episode. Keel released The Right to Rock, their major label debut. Uh, Lay Down the Law came out in 84, and just a few months later, The Right to Rock came out in 1985. It was produced by Gene Simmons. Um, they re-recorded three songs. Wrote a couple new songs, did a couple Gene Simmons songs, and a cover of the Rolling Stones, Let's Spend the Night Together. Great album, great production. Um, I saw, I think in Metal Edge they were voted uh, Best New Band. Absolutely just an amazing record that everybody should really check out and own. It's underrated, not unknown, but underrated. Alrighty, I got two more I want to talk about. Thanks for hanging with me. I'm a little short of breath and a little, my voice is going a little bit. So, Next one I want to talk about, I also mentioned in my underrated follow-ups record, and that's Autograph, the album That's the Stuff. Um, I really liked the single, Blondes and Black Cars. I thought if you liked the first Autograph record, there was no reason not to like the second Autograph record. As a matter of fact, I know I'm in the minority, but I think they got better with their first three albums. Each one got a little bit better than the one before. So if you liked the first record, uh, sign in, please. No reason you wouldn't like That's the Stuff. Uh, check that one out. The final one is, an, is a band 
band or guy. The guy is Adam Bomb. The band is Adam Bomb. A D A M Bomb. Um, I first discovered them. They had like a flexi disc that had a, I want my heavy metal um, inside of a magazine, so you could check it out for free. And I remember a friend of mine had it, and I thought it was pretty darn good. Um, the band was Adam Bomb on guitar and vocals. Jimmy Crespo of Aerosmith fame was the second guitarist. Cliff Williams of ACDC played some bass along with Phil Fight or Feet, F-I-E-T, who played with um, Joan Jett and Billy Idol. He was the other bass player at the time. And Sandy Slavin, I believe is how I pronounce it, from Riot was the drummer. So kind of some big names Geffen put around him to help him, you know, get over the top. But it just really didn't happen for Adam Bomb, but I did really like that debut album. He's out there, he's still making music, and believe it or not, I really need to do an episode on him because he has like collaborated with so many people, it's crazy. He was in TKO before he signed to Geffen as a solo artist, and uh, Fatal Attraction is the name of the album by Adam Bomb, and I thought it was very underrated and came out in 1985. So 1985 was a huge year in music, Lots of established acts releasing their second, third records, um, just solidifying this music as uh, the music for the next five or six years. Um, some of my underrated records. Um, let me know who I missed or who you think was underrated that released an album in 1985. I'm sure there's a lot that I missed. Such a great year. It's really starting to ramp up the number of releases out there and a lot of great stuff. So thank you very much for watching and I will catch you on the next episode.